If you search the internet about the war that gave birth to the state of Israel, one little village outside of Jerusalem is sure to get a lot of mentions, Deir Yassin. It was a tiny Arab village of about 600 people. And yet, according to many historians, what happened there on April 9th, 1948, was one of the key events of the war, usually known by Israelis as the War of Independence and by Arabs as the Nakba or Catastrophe. Now, if you've been paying close attention to our other videos, and if you haven't, you should go back and watch some of them, they're great. You might have noticed something. We're talking about an event that happened a month before the official start of the 1948 war. That's because intense and open warfare between Arabs and Jews was already long underway by that point, even while the British were still officially in charge of the territory. So yes, even though the story of Deir Yassin took place before the war technically started, it was significant enough to be considered one of the key events of that war. Like many other events of the war, this story presents real challenges for anyone who wants to tell it in a fair and honest way. Search online and you'll get all kinds of claims, some backed up by evidence and some not. So let's go through those claims and pick apart what's substantiated by historians and what's now acknowledged to have been propaganda on both sides. In order to understand what actually happened at Deir Yassin, we need to go back to a date five and a half months earlier, November 29th, 1947. That's when the United Nations voted to adopt Resolution 181, partitioning the mandate for Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab. While the Zionist leaders reluctantly accepted the result, the Arabs emphatically rejected the vote. They resented international outsiders deciding what happened to what they saw as their land and were determined to defeat any effort to establish a Jewish state in any part of mandatory Palestine. A new wave of violence between Arabs and Jews broke out right away, initiated by Arab violence, stabbings, shootings, road blockades, and some bombings. This was the beginning of the first phase of the war before the entire region was engulfed in an interstate conflict in May 1948. From November 1947 to March 1948, the Arab forces continued to increase their attacks. They had the upper hand, with thousands of volunteer fighters from surrounding Arab countries infiltrating the region. Among other things, some of these forces organized a siege of Jerusalem, trapping the 100,000 Jewish residents of the city and preventing shipments of food or supplies. The effects were devastating. The main Jewish fighting force, the Haganah, made many attempts to break through the blockade, but simply couldn't. Nearly all of its armored vehicles were destroyed and hundreds of its fighters were killed trying to bring supplies to Jerusalem. Israelis feared the Arab forces would win. By the end of March 1948, the situation for the Jews was so desperate that the US seriously considered withdrawing its support for the UN's partition plan because they became convinced the Jews would lose against the Arabs. Meanwhile, the Arab fighters now felt they had the military strength to put an end to the partition plan and prevent a Jewish state from being established. By April 5th, the Haganah was desperate for more on the different strategies they tried, you can check out our episode, Weird Ways Israel Won Its War of Independence. But ultimately, they launched Operation Nachshon, a military operation aimed at breaking the siege of Jerusalem by opening the road from Tel Aviv. The Arabs had been able to block supplies to Jerusalem by controlling several strategic vantage points along the highway, from which they ambushed and fired on Israeli convoys. Deir Yassin was one of those strategic locations. It was less than a mile from the Jerusalem suburbs and was on a hill that overlooked a large portion of the city. So it was placed on a list of Arab villages to be taken over as part of Operation Nachshon. By the time the Jewish forces decided to advance into Deir Yassin, most of the Arab villages to the west of Jerusalem had already been abandoned by the residents. The battle took place on April 9th, 1948. What happened that day is the subject of much disagreement, but here's what seems clear. Even though the Haganah planned Operation Nachshon, the move against Deir Yassin was actually carried out by two smaller paramilitary groups, the Irgun and Lehi. Although these fighters lacked the training and equipment of the Haganah, they didn't anticipate any major resistance and felt that they could achieve their goals. So in the early morning of April 9th, 120 men from the Irgun and Lehi arrived at the village in two groups. They brought along a van with a bullhorn to deliver a message in Arabic that the villagers should put down their weapons and flee. Now, it's not clear whether the warning message was ever sent though, and if it was, whether it was heard by the inhabitants of the village. According to Benny Morris, the van overturned in a ditch and fierce fighting ensued. Abu Mahmoud, an Arab villager, told the BBC in 1998 that he did hear the warning from the van. Some accounts don't mention any warning though, and instead present the advance on Deir Yassin as a premeditated plot to murder its residents. Former Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who was the leader of the Irgun at the time of the attack, said that a substantial number of residents actually did leave the village before the fighting began, having heeded the warnings from the arriving Jewish troops. So it's not clear how many people in Deir Yassin actually heard the warnings. Still, all agree that the Arabs who stayed offered fierce resistance, which surprised the Irgun fighters. 
In response, the Jewish troops used hand grenades, killing many, including both armed and unarmed civilians. The question though is why? According to Begin, the clash was a house-to-house -house battle in which the use of hand grenades was necessary. Professor Daniel Gordis argues that the ill-prepared Irgun fighters used the grenades in a panic when their communications equipment failed and they were fired upon by residents. According to Benny Morris, the Irgun fighters used grenades only under great pressure, having been pinned down by fire at each house. Some sources, on the other hand, view the throwing of hand grenades into houses as a deliberate tactic to increase casualties. Fahime Ala Mustafa Zaydan, who was 11 years old at the time, later reported that the Jewish forces blew the door down, entered and started searching the place. They got to the storeroom and took us out one by one. They shot the son-in-law, and when one of his daughters screamed, they shot her too. We all started screaming and crying, but were told that if we did not stop, they would shoot us all. They then lined us up, shot at us, and left. Yehuda Avner, a future Israeli diplomat who was living in nearby Beit HaKerem at the time, described in his diary that he heard explosions that morning from Deir Yassin and went over to investigate. He wrote that he saw prisoners taken around town, in lorry with their hands up, ideas to bolster morale, rumored they were to be shot. Walking home, we saw the captured women and children in a truck. They just stared, many Jews around. I felt ashamed the way they cheered. In total, among the Jewish forces, four were killed and 40 were wounded. And now is when we start to get to some of the false reports. At the time, many sources, including the Haganah, Irgun, Arab reports, the head of the Red Cross in Jerusalem, and the New York Times said the death toll was closer to 200 or 250 Arabs. Today, these casualty numbers are regarded as highly exaggerated. The accepted figure of 107 for the Arab death toll comes from a 1988 investigation by a Palestinian university. But what makes the saga of Deir Yassin so controversial isn't just the number of people killed. There's also the question of whether atrocities were committed by the Irgun and Lehi forces. And most importantly, how the legend of the Deir Yassin massacre and the propaganda surrounding it led to fear among the Palestinian Arabs. Many horrific reports were spread by the Arabs in the days after the attack. There was the account of surviving villagers being paraded through Jewish neighborhoods of West Jerusalem before being summarily executed. And the claim that many women and children were brutally slaughtered at Deir Yassin, publicized in a broadcast by the Arab headquarters in Ramallah. Some reports from Israelis who were eyewitnesses to the fighting or arrived shortly thereafter did testify to saying some horrible things like executions. But some of the claims of atrocities certainly appear to have been fictitious. Arab reports at the time stated that there were multiple instances of rape, especially of school children, which the Irgun fighters immediately denied. Now, these allegations persist to this day, despite the fact that both Israeli and Palestinian scholars have concluded that there is no evidence whatsoever of rape having taken place. That said, some reports do suggest that the actions of the Irgun and Lehi fighters show an indifference to human life. And here's where things get even more complicated. For example, we have the testimony of the Lehi commander of the operation, Yehoshua Zettler, who denied that his men carried out a massacre in the village, but admitted that they put explosives in each home, causing the inhabitants to run away. In his words, within a few hours, half the village isn't there anymore. The same commander said that he was disgusted to see that his men had burned the bodies of those who were killed. And yet, historian Eliezer Tauber argues that Deir Yassin was not merely a poorly organized battle which led to a massacre. Instead, he suggests it was a myth perpetrated by the Palestinian Arab leadership whose purpose was to bring the surrounding Arab armies into the battle. The exaggerated reports of some 250 deaths at Deir Yassin, as well as the allegations that atrocities were committed, had unexpected consequences. Some Jewish leaders, who were political rivals of the Irgun, thought that the charges of cruelty would discredit the group and did not attempt to challenge the Arab claims. Meanwhile, Arab sources cited Deir Yassin as the impetus for carrying out the Hadassah convoy massacre five days later. In that attack, a convoy bringing supplies and personnel to Hadassah Hospital on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem was ambushed by Arab forces, resulting in the deaths of 78 doctors, nurses, students, patients, faculty members, and Haganah fighters. From the Arab perspective, they also hoped that the image of atrocities committed by Jews against the Arab population would mobilize the Arab countries to intervene in the conflict. For example, Arab leader Hussein Khalidi told a Palestinian news editor at the time, we must make the most of this. The Palestine Broadcasting Service then issued a press release stating that at Deir Yassin, children were murdered, pregnant women were raped, all sorts of atrocities. It's also clear that the Arab propaganda created a legend among ordinary people and soldiers about the ferocity of the Irgun fighters spreading panic at the mere mention of the organization. Begin wrote, not what happened at Deir Yassin, but what was invented about Deir Yassin helped to carve the way to our decisive victories on the battlefield. The legend was worth half a dozen battalions to the forces of Israel. And 
for those who wanted nothing more than for the Arabs to just leave, these stories only prompted more Arabs to flee their homes, ultimately making them refugees. The hyperbole surrounding the events of that day in which the Arabs wanted to demonize the Jewish enemy to rile up local Arabs and inflame the entire Arab world was so effective that it did just that. It terrified the Arabs to the point that many fled, ultimately becoming refugees of the war. The Haganah also benefited from spreading the story and building up the tragedy to show the world that the Irgun was not fit to lead the fledgling state. But perhaps the biggest lesson we can draw from the story of Dir Yassin is the impact the narrative of Dir Yassin has had on the formation of the Palestinian identity. The events of one day in this small village can be seen as the beginning of the Nakba, the catastrophe for the Palestinians. And to this day, Dir Yassin is one of the key points in the ongoing delegitimization of Israel. At various points, it has been weaponized, exaggerated, or mythologized to make the Jewish armies look like demons and the Jewish state to be born in sin. In the end, the capture of Dir Yassin in April 1948 was a strategic victory for the Jews trying to break the Arab siege on Jerusalem. But the killing of civilians, even if some were armed, makes it an undeniable tragedy. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week. We'll